<laughs> Exodus 14, beginning at verse 8, reading through verse 23, the King James text today reads, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihiroth before Belzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Now listen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them, to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Amen. Exodus 14, 8 through 23. Now, let's go to the Lord in prayer before I 
am able to finish delivering this word today. Lord, we thank you, God, for the wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Lord, for our relationship with you. We're grateful, God, that we serve the master of the sea. He who is able to speak calm to a roaring sea. Master, in the name of Jesus, I loose the presence and power of the Holy Ghost in this message. I ask God that you would release in me a mighty anointing, that you would allow me to deliver with fervor, with passion, the Word of God, which you have placed in my spirit for your people at this hour. Inspire, encourage, uplift, give direction and hope. <coughs> Even now, O God, as those who are listening receive and hear the word of the Lord allow them to know God by the reason of the anointing that that which they hear is more than merely the words of men but it is indeed a word from the Lord we ask all this in none other than Jesus wonderful name amen praise God and amen Excuse me. Most of us are familiar today with the story of the exodus of the Jewish people from the land of Egypt after they had been enslaved in that country for some 400 years. It's an awful long time. Many <coughs> generations had come and gone. We do not know exactly how many Jewish people were leaving Egypt at this hour. The Word of God only tells us there were about 600 men. Now let me tell you how, um, when you read that in the Word of the Lord, let me tell you how uh, they determined this, okay? <sighs> In biblical times, the way that Israel would conduct an audit of their uh, numbers, they would only count the males, listen carefully now, who were of fighting age. They, they didn't count all the men, they counted only the men who in essence could serve in the armed forces. So basically you might say they counted the young men between the ages of 16 and 40, roughly. Okay? So therefore, this is how they would do, because God would now allow Israel. One of the rules that God said on the nation of Israel is that they could not count their number. And the reason they couldn't do this, the Lord didn't want any king or any leader in Israel being able to brag about, you know, how great his nation was in terms of the number of citizens that it had. Therefore, they were not allowed to count the entirety of their citizenry. But what they did allow, what God did allow, is he allowed them to count the men who were of fighting age, okay? So when we read in the Word of God that approximately six 600,000 men plus women and children followed Moses out of Egypt. We are able to know that in reality there were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of two to two and a half million people, okay? Because you have to take into account the elderly men, you have to take into account children, and you have to take into account the women, okay? So when you consider families would have more than one child, so on and so forth, then you're able to determine there were probably roughly two million, as many as two and a half, that's a lot of people to move. As the children of Israel followed Moses out of Egypt, they came to a place in their path where the sea, the Red Sea, sat before them. And it was an obstacle, obviously, to them. So they pitched tents and they decided, all right, we'll set up camp here. What they didn't know is that although Pharaoh had allowed them voluntarily to leave Egypt, the Lord moved on Pharaoh's heart. That's why the Word of God said that the Lord hardened 
Pharaoh's heart. The Lord moved on Pharaoh's heart and he caused Pharaoh to become kind of angry and bitter. And all of a sudden Pharaoh said, you know what? Uh, these plagues that have come upon us and all the things that have happened and Moses standing before me and performing these miracles and all this stuff that made me decide to let these people go. He said, well, you know, in the end, I'm going to look foolish. I'm going to be embarrassed. History is not going to look well on me. A lot of people say, well, there's nothing in Egyptian history. There's nothing in Egyptian hieroglyphs or anything that allude to 400 years of Jewish captivity in Egypt. Well, of course, uh, I, I don't know if many of you are aware of this or if many of you watch history television or anything, but one little thing that the Egyptians and many other cultures used to love to do, anything that would prove to be an embarrassment to them historically, they would erase. There were pharaohs who served as pharaoh and as king of Egypt for decades. And there were all kind of mention of them in various places and in various ways. And yet when that pharaoh died, the new pharaoh said, man, that guy was an embarrassment to us. He was a humiliation to us. The things he did were so ridiculous. Let's just wipe him out. And every image of him, every mention of him, everything of about him they would literally just whitewash and erase because they didn't want anybody being able to go back historically and even see his name or see his image so if you wonder why there isn't any uh, a lot of historical record in Egypt concerning the captivity of the Israelites this is probably why this was a common practice in this era they didn't have the internet they didn't have um, printed, even printed historical records. They didn't have historians like we do today who make, you know, a certain record of certain things. They had historians, yes, don't misunderstand me, but they didn't have paper and pen and, you know, it was not as easy to keep records of things and therefore it was much easier to erase records of things if you wanted to delete that from your history so as not to be embarrassed by it. Well, Pharaoh recognized that the children of Israel being allowed to leave voluntarily because basically he'd been scared into releasing them. All of a sudden his heart became hardened and he sent his armies after, each, after Israel. Now here Israel was, they were probably a day or two ahead in their march, they were at the Red Sea, there they sit in front of the Red Sea and all of a sudden they look backwards and they see the armies of Egypt coming after them, they say, oh my Lord, that Pharaoh let us go just so he could send his armies out to destroy us in the wilderness. Here we are between a rock and a hard place. Here we are between Egypt and the Red Sea. We can't move. We can't go anywhere. Moses, what did you do? Bring us out here to die. I'm going to tell you, it's funny. God's people have a habit of just assuming the worst instead of looking toward heaven and saying, all right, Lord, you brought me this far. How are you going to get me out of this mess? Come on now. How many times do we forget what God's done for us in the past? They'd already forgotten about God turning the waters of Egypt into blood. They'd already forgotten about God causing the firstborn in Egypt to die. They'd already forgotten about the lice and the flies and the frogs. They'd already forgotten about all the miracles that God had performed in an effort to convince Pharaoh to release them to begin with. They'd already forgotten about those things. How many miracles in my life have I forgotten about because today I face a struggle. Because today I face an obstacle. Because today something new is before me. And instead of looking up toward heaven and saying, Lord, you've done it before, you can do it again. Hallelujah. I look up toward heaven and say, all right, Lord, you got brought me here to kill me. I just know, Lord, I will be homeless and hungry before too long. Yes, Jesus, thank you, Lord. You blessed me for all them years. And now you brought me here to die. 
I am the sufferer. Hello now. How many of us have done that? But here's the interesting thing. The Lord instructs Moses. He said, you know what? He said, you tell those people you're moving forward. You tell those people you're going to be marching forward. Well, uh, Lord, I don't know if you noticed or not, but forward of us is the Red Sea. <laughs> I don't know how you figure we're going to march forward when we've got a sea before us. The Lord said, Moses, I'm going to have you lift up your rod. I'm going to have you lift it above the waters. And as you do that, I'm going to cause the waters to part. And and I'm going to allow that land, that earth that was once the seabed, I'm going to allow that earth to dry. Now that's going to take a little bit of time to happen. But don't you worry. I'm leading you. I'm in front of you. I got this thing. So Moses does as the Lord commanded. And the Red Sea parted. And the, light, the word of God said, the Lord sent a strong east wind. And that wind went for hours and hours and hours across through that crevice, that pathway the Lord had created through the Red Sea. That wind just went right across it. Well, what do you think the wind was doing? It was drying the ground. It was causing the water that was still in the sand, in the dirt, in the soil to evaporate and to dry up. It was turning what had been seeped into virtual uh, uh, yeah, sure, pavement. That's the word I was looking for. Into virtual pavement. These people had carts. They had animals. They had all kinds of wheeled things they were bringing through. They had to have something of a roadway. They, they couldn't go through mud. Never mind water, but they couldn't go through mud and muck. They needed dry land. Well, sometimes God's miracles are great. But sometimes they don't happen in a minute. Sometimes they take a little bit of time. For the Lord to fully do what He's trying to do, it's going to take a little bit. Boy, if there's anything in the world we don't like is time when we feel pressed from the back. Hello now. When we got the enemy pressing up behind us. When we got thoughts of hunger. When we got thoughts of homelessness. When we're worried about paying the mortgage. When we're worried about paying the rent. When we're worried about making our car payment or buying groceries. And we got that behind us staring us in the eye. We sure enough don't want to have to sit where we are and wait for the ocean, for the sea pit to dry, do we? No, 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 no. We don't want to wait. I'm going to tell you right now, Tommy and I, we don't want to wait. We, we'd love for him to get an offer for a job tomorrow. That way we know what in the world we're doing and where we're going and how much he'll be making and so on and so forth. Waiting can be torturous. But listen, here's where God is good. Here's where we're going to learn something from this story that I read to you today that you may not have paid much attention to. The story of the children of Israel's deliverance out of the bondage of Egyptian slavery is one of the most spoken of stories in all of God's Word. Over and over again, the Lord speaks of Himself as the one who delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt. For instance, in Exodus 20 and verse 2, God says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. In Deuteronomy 5 and 6, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. In Joshua 24, verses 1 through 7, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, 
the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and ye came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt, and ye dwell in the wilderness a long season. This story of the Egyptian, uh, excuse me, the Israeli release from Egyptian bondage is a story we, we read often of in the Word of God. In Stephen's final sermon, he articulates the story of the Israeli bondage in Egypt and the mighty deliverance of the Lord. So important is this story to the Jewish people that when the apostles preached in the hearing of a Jewish audience, they always demonstrated their clear understanding of this central and important account. While we often focus on the parting of the Red Sea, and the later drowning of Pharaoh and his armies, we often miss some important and exciting truths. For instance, where is the Lord? Where is the Lord when he is not, listen to me children, when he is not leading us? We all have felt at times that we were marching forward without anyone to lead us, even the Lord. We're leadershipless. We're trying our best to walk in the will of God and to follow His lead, but for some reasons unknown, even God appears to no longer be in front of us. Where on earth can God be? Well, Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 and 20 holds some important and inspiring revelations today for us. Listen, I read it to you a little while ago, but I'm reading it again. And the angel of God, oh hallelujah, I'm going to get happy if you don't like tongue talking and dancing and shouting, then you might as well go somewhere else right now because I'm bound to get happy. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. <laughs> and the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Oh my God. And it, came, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Woo! Glory. Listen, children. The Lord was leading Israel as a pillar of cloud by day and as a pillar of fire by night. When they got to the Red Sea, that pillar was standing in front of them. I imagine it was probably right over the beach. It was probably right there at the, at the, where the land met the sea. But after God told Moses, lift your rod and cause the sea to part, the Egyptians are behind you. They're coming up behind you and they're coming up fast. After the sea parted, God moved. <laughs> God moved. 
He moved from before them to behind them. Hallelujah. He got between them woo, and their trouble. He got between them and what was coming after them. He got between them and the enemy. Hallelujah to God. I'm here to tell you when you feel like God isn't in front of you. It's because he's moved. He's behind you. Hallelujah. He is keeping you safe from that which would follow you. He is keeping you safe from that which would overtake you. He is keeping you safe from that which would destroy you. Oh, hallelujah. And the word of God, listen, the word of God says that that pillar of cloud <laughs> that at night became a pillar of fire so it was a light for the children of Israel but during the day it was visible because it was a cloud the word of God tells us in our primary text <laughs> that that pillar moved behind the children of Israel it stood between them and the Egyptians listen and it became darkness to the Egyptians. It blocked out the sun. It didn't allow the Egyptians to have any light. They were in pitch blackness. They couldn't move. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. Why? Because they couldn't see. They had to pitch up camp. They had to build fires. They had to sit right where they were without being able to move a muscle because they couldn't see nothing. God was blacking out the sun and causing them to be in complete and utter darkness. Oh, but listen, children, this is what excites the flames out of me. But the other side of the same pillar was fire for the people of Israel so that during the night they still had light they could still see what they needed to see so they could prepare themselves for the crossing over oh hallelujah oh my god you wonder where is the lord where is the Lord? I don't, I don't feel like God is leading me. I don't feel like the Lord is in front of me. Where is the Lord? Oh, honey, He's still there. He's just behind you. Hallelujah. What He's doing right now is He's standing between you and your trouble. He's standing between you and death. He's standing between you and homelessness. He's standing between you and starvation. He's standing between you and the enemy that would destroy you. He's making sure that that enemy cannot advance upon you until his miracle is fully ready. Hallelujah to God. Well, my God, that's exciting. Where is the Lord? If you've ever watched drill sergeants watch movies, you know, where they have army battalions or bunches of marines marching you know in formation if you ever notice sometimes as they're marching their drill sergeant's right out front isn't he he's marching and he's shouting out his marching orders as they march and every once in a while you'll see that drill sergeant begin to fall back he's on the side of them but he's still screaming out the orders, isn't he? Left, 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 right, left, left, left. But as he's given the order, he's moving along the side. And he's dropping further and further back. And he's able to watch every soldier that's marching with him to see if they're marching the way they ought to be marching, isn't he? Amen. Has he stopped marching? No. He's still moving with you. The only difference is he's not in front of you. He's moving behind you. Hello now. But honey, is he still your leader? Is he still leading you? Oh, you better believe he is. The Word of God said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the same are the sons of God. 
God's people are led by the Lord. But that doesn't mean He's always going to be in front of you. <laughs> Sometimes you get to looking for Him. And you say, where is the Lord? I don't see the Lord. Where would that pillar go? I, wait a minute. Lord, have you left us? Have you abandoned us? Lord, what's going on here? He said, no, look behind you. <laughs> I'm back here protecting you. I'm back here preserving you. I'm back here buying you the time that is needed for the seabed to dry so that you can cross on dry land. Hallelujah to God. Oh my goodness. Sometimes the Lord chooses to move from his position as leader to the position of follower. Here in our text we read that the Lord moved from before the children of Israel to, inst uh, to instead post himself behind them. Not only did he serve as a barrier between Israel and the pursuing armies of Pharaoh, but he caused darkness to swallow up the enemy camp while simultaneously providing light for the camp of Israel. Let me tell you, children, i got exciting news. God can be darkness to our enemies while at the same time being light for our souls. Hallelujah. Some people ask us, one God, Jesus' name, apostolic preachers, how on earth can God be both the Father and the Son? <laughs> Doesn't God have to be two people? To be the Father and to be the Son at the same time? No. No, the same way He can be darkness upon the Egyptians while providing light for the Jews. Hallelujah. The same cloud, a manifestation of God Himself representing His very presence and power was both darkness behind Him and light before him. Hallelujah. You wonder how one God can be the Father and be the Son. There you go. Because honey, if he can't be both the Father and the Son without having to be two separate people, then he's a pretty poor God. I don't know about you, but I grew up singing, My God can do anything Anything, anything, oh my God can do anything. He made this earth and all its fullness and all that time shall bring, oh my God can do anything. If he can do anything, if he can be one pillar and on one side be light and on the other side be darkness, then he can be one God, hallelujah, sitting in the throne as the Father and simultaneously walking the earth as the Son. Hallelujah to God. Oh my God. Had to throw a little oneness in there for you. My Lord, when you fear the Lord is no longer leading you, be aware He may have changed positions. He now stands behind you to hinder your enemies and buy you time for the sands of the Red Sea seabed to dry so that you might cross over on dry land. Crossing the Red Sea on wet and muddy ground would have been an impossible task. It would have taken a very long time and would have caused great difficulties for the many wagons and vehicles being used by the children of Israel. The ground had to be dry. And for the ground to dry, even with a divinely provided strong east wind, they needed time for the ground to fully dry, thus creating a sort of pavement. 
making their passage far easier and much swifter in order for that time to be allowed to pass for the ground to dry. God said, okay, I'm still leading. I'm still your leader, but I'm going to move from in front of you to behind you to make sure your enemy cannot come any closer, to make sure that which would overtake you and destroy you cannot come up behind you and do that while you're waiting on the miracle to be complete. <laughs> See, God's already got your miracle going, honey. Whatever it is you're waiting on the Lord for, I got news for you. It's already cooking. It's already on the stove right now. Oh, God's already set the timer. And now while we wait, and listen, listen, God is leading, but that doesn't always mean that you have to be moving every moment. <sighs> there are times... When God wants us to stop, stand, stay still. That's His direction. That's His orders. That's what He says to do. The children of Israel, they, they couldn't just move forward directly through that muddy earth that was now, you know, uh, the part between the uh, Red Sea, they could have just immediately moved across, but the Lord said, no, no, for the moment, you just stand still. My orders, my direction, stand still. When God tells you to stand still, you don't need to see Him right in front of you. Because you ain't supposed to be moving no way, no how, anywhere. Just stand still. But where's God? He's behind you. <laughs> He's moved behind you. He's protecting you. He's preserving you. He's keeping you. Oh, my God, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you today. In Jeremiah 2, 4 through 8, the word of the Lord said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone from me? and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priests said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you, too many people get to a place in their life where God is working on your behalf. You just don't know what all God is doing. And because you don't see the Lord in front of you, you assume He's abandoned you. Are you hearing me today? You assume He's abandoned you. But He hasn't abandoned you. He's behind you. He's allowing you to have daylight when others have darkness. He's allowing you to see what others cannot see. The sad thing is the children of Israel backslid and went off after false gods when they couldn't see God the way that, that their false forefathers had seen the Lord and I'm here to tell you he said the, the priests and the prophets nobody asked where is the Lord they didn't seek after him they just assumed because they couldn't see him that he wasn't there do you hear what I'm telling you Jesus said behold I am with you always even unto the end of the world I want to tell you I remember being in the hospital back in 2000 I was in pretty pitiful condition. I was on life support. I was occasionally 
alert. Occasionally, I was conscious. I, on occasion, would see hallucinations and all kind of wonderful things because of the medication they have you on when you're intubated. And my brother Michael had brought a picture of Jesus. And if I remember correctly, I believe it was a picture of the Lord walking on the water. And he had put it up on the wall in the hospital room where I could see it from my bed. And I remember at one point, I came to for a little bit and I looked up and I saw that picture on the wall. I'll never forget this as long as I live. And I looked at that picture and I began to pray. Now I couldn't speak because I was intubated through the throat. But in my mind I began to speak to the Lord. I said, Lord, I have never in my life felt more alone, felt more abandoned, felt more like you were nowhere to be found. I have never felt so devoid of your presence in my entire life. And it is a horrible, horrible feeling. Then I said, but Lord, I know you're here with me. I didn't say I believe you're here. I said, I know you're here with me. Because in the Word of God, you promised. And the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And you don't talk just to hear your own voice. If you've said it, it is so. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And you promised you'd be with me. I said, so therefore, I know you're here. Whether I feel you or I don't feel you, I know you're here. Because you said you'd be. Children, I won't tell you, too many people backslide and give up on God because they go through circumstances and situations that cause them to lose sight of the Lord. Sometimes we go through circumstances and situations where we feel like we're between a rock and a hard place and we're looking for the Lord to intervene. We're looking for the Lord to be there and we can't see Him. And we then... Instead of putting our confidence in the promises of God, instead of putting our confidence in the Word of God, we put our confidence in our feelings. Ooh. And we give up on living for God. We give up on going to church. We give up on trying to be a child of God and live this life because we can't see the Lord in front of us. The Lord says not only do they not see me, he said, but they don't even ask, where is he? Where is the Lord? What does the word of God say about those who ask? Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Isn't that what Jesus said? So, honey, if you want to know today, where is the Lord? The Lord said, all you've got to do is ask. And I promise you, you may hear a voice not coming from the in front of you, but you may hear a voice coming from behind you, and that voice is going to say, I'm back here! I'm being what the Word of God refers to as your re-reward. Re-reward in biblical times, that was used uh, in reference to uh, armies or forces that followed that were behind. Because as an army marches, you've got to have somebody protecting the back. So you don't wind up being surprised and ambushed from the back. You know, we think about soldiers marching in war, and we think about how they have to send scouts ahead to see what's going on behind them, excuse me, in front of them. But I've got news for you, honey. Any good army also has scouts who are going backwards to see what's coming up behind them. Do you hear what I'm telling you? They've got strong armor. They've got strong people at the front of the line. But I got news for you. They got equally as strong armor and equally as strong people and equally as strong weapons at the back. 
Because if the enemy shows up behind them, they can't afford to be weak at the back. You hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, there are times when the Lord moves from in front of you to behind you because you need the strength behind you at the moment. You need that protection behind you at the moment. Hallelujah. Oh, Tommy, I'm here to tell you today, the devil can't advance any further. He can't come any closer. The things you fear the most, the things that we're the most worried about, the Lord says, I'm stopping it all dead in its tracks. It can't move until my miracle has finished revealing itself. Hallelujah. Oh my God, isn't this wonderful today? God has not abandoned you. You're looking forward desiring Him to lead. But for the moment He has taken a position behind you to make certain your enemies cannot advance upon you and consume you. He's got your back. Hallelujah. You know that old phrase, He's got your back? He's got your back. Where is the Lord? He is behind you. He is obstructing your enemies, providing you with light so that you can fully prepare to make the crossing as Sikando Robo Shatatonamaha. Oh, glory. As soon as... Mm. He's obstructing your enemies, providing you with light, so that you may fully prepare to make the crossing as soon as the ground has dried and preparing the way before you. He has, he has assumed the role of your re reward. In Isaiah 52 and 12, For ye shall not go out with haste, neither, excuse me, nor go by flight. For the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your re reward. He'll be your protection at the rear. Hallelujah. When the Lord is not before you, it is not because you do not at the moment require leadership. Now is the time to stand still and wait. If you look for the Lord to lead and you do not find Him before you, Know that he has simply changed positions. And he is now behind you, protecting you, defending you. Giving you time for the miracle he is performing to be made complete. Hallelujah. Glory.